Great. Keep, um, if you haven't found that passage yet, you might like to find it. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to refer to it about five times. Um, one verse, very important verse. 1 Corinthians 12, page 1089. And um, we are going to pray. Fantastic. Father, thank you for this chance to be together this morning. Thank you for your amazing promise, the promise of the Father, that you will pour out your Spirit on all flesh, on all people. And we thank you that we are the inheritors of that promise, that you promise to fill us with your Holy Spirit, with the very empowering presence of God. And we pray this morning that you would come amongst us powerfully. Connect with us, Lord, the the deepest parts of our beings, our our soul, our spirit, everything, the seat of who we are. And we want to draw close to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see you. Um, There are a few visitors here today, and so um, you're very welcome as well. And um, what we're talking about uh, this month is our values as a church. And we have four key values. Um, You have to stop somewhere, and there there are about 25 that would be great to have, but actually we've kind of pushed them down, um, consolidated them down to four. And um, here they are in a nutshell. So the first one is aim high. We talked about this two weeks ago. Um, This is about taking those steps of faith. We want to live out um, audacious faith in our lives. We want to take those risks where, you know, we're not just going to lead a human life. We're going to lead a spirit-filled human life. And that means that actually we're going to take risks for God. We're going to take um, those steps of faith in our workplace, in our homes, in our communities, so that actually we can see the kind of life that God wants us to, to lead. Not kind of really weird and abnormal, but actually that supernatural life. Um, one friend said, described it as being supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. That's a really nice kind of uh, way of summing it up. So aiming high, and that also affects our relationships, the way we tackle life, the way we tackle church, the way we do church together. We want to do the best that we can. Um, The second value is give it away. This is about being generous as a church community and as individuals. We want to give um, ourselves to one another. We want to give ourselves to this church community. We want to give away our faith. We want to be generous with our faith. Do you remember that um, quote from that Indian uh, missionary who said, um, Sri Lankan missionary, um, Andy Niles, said, uh, it's like one beggar helping another beggar to find food. That's what Christianity is about. That's the Christian faith, about one beggar helping another beggar to find food. We're all in need. And, but actually, we can be generous as we help other people to find that faith ourselves. So we want to give away our faith. We want to be generous with our faith. That's why we, we want to keep on running the Alpha course. We want to keep on inviting people to that course so they can discover for themselves the Christian faith. And we want to be generous with our finances. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that um, today. We are um, challenged in our finances at the moment for various reasons. I'll go into that later on. And so we want to embody this value ourselves as a church where we can give um, our finances. The third value, which I'm going to speak about today, is enjoy it with others. And I'll come back to that um, in a moment. And then our final one is bow the knee. So bow the knee next week and um, enjoy it with others this week. And so this value, this third value, is summarized in this verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now... You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And the way we think about this, I'm going to draw this out. So, number three, enjoy it with others. And we're trying to do this in a similar way to that, where you know anyone can kind of um, draw this out on a napkin. 
that's supposed to be a child buggy. Um, and uh, you know, this is something for anyone to be able to do, just to explain who we are and what we're about as a church family, and um, you know, the, why we do and why we think what we do. So this is enjoying it with others. And the first way I want to explore with this is that this is about, I'll just put it here, loving relationships. In this family of the church, enjoying it with others, we are to have loving relationships. And the way I'm going to draw this, let's do it here, um, is... got the idea? So they're all kind of hands like that. So it's um, simple. It's so, so easy that you can draw it yourself, basically. My terrible drawing is a gift to everyone because anyone can do it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You are the body of Christ. You is not singular. It's you, plural. You. You are the body of Christ. The Christian faith is not supposed to be done alone. It's not supposed to be something that, you know, we turn up to with other people. We just have our own um, uh, little world in church, and then we go away, and then we can get on with life. And, we, and it's a private thing. No, the Christian faith is not supposed to be that. It's you, plural. You are part of a body. Paul, when he's developing this thinking, is saying, actually, every one of you is a part of this. And so as you are knit together, our relationships are important. The way we relate to each other, we can't just say, oh, I don't need you, and I don't need you, I'm just, I'm the most important thing, you know, the way I kind of do things in the church is the most important way of doing it, I don't care about anyone else. No, it's the opposite, it's actually saying, wow, look at all this, these different things within the church, I'm encouraged to relate to them, to prefer them, to make others feel special, so loving relationships is at the heart of this. And in, our, um, in this year, we're giving a focus over, over the whole year to discipleship, a year of discipleship. And we want to learn, as a church community, how to make disciples. Jesus' call to the disciples was go into the world and make disciples of all nations. So we're called, individually and together, to make disciples. Making disciples involves someone else. It's not just my private life of discipleship. It's me helping someone else to become a disciple. It's me actually being helped by someone else to make me a disciple. We're all involved in this. And so um, the reason we want to do making disciples is because we, we love each other. I want the best for you because I love you. I'm called to love you because Jesus has poured out his love into us. This is what we looked at a little bit before. We've received grace from God to give that grace away. We've received love from God to give that love away. And so the way we relate together in this church community is by loving each other. And um, how do we actually do that? Well, three, three ways, I think. First of all, it's in community. Jesus, remember, called 12 disciples to be with him. And he did life together with those disciples. They were in community. Um, one of the uh, phrases that is often used in Acts and the um, epistles, the, the letters that are written in the New Testament, is a, a word oikos, which means household, the household of faith, the house that meets in this particular person's, um, you know, the church that meets in this particular person's house. It was an oikos, which means a household of people. There were family people in that household. But there were also extended family. There were friends. There, there was a community, servants, lo lots of different people who were all um, beginning to learn to relate in the way Jesus calls us to relate. And so it's done together where relationships are nurtured and grown. For us here, we do that in connect groups. And we want to encourage every person to be in a connect group. There's something like 60% of people in a connect group in the church. We'd love that to, well, an initial target for the next few months would be 80% um, in connect groups. Ideally, everyone could be in a connect group. That's what we're, the final aim is. I, I think that works itself out as a value um, that, you know, we begin to start hearing we more than I 
in our conversations. We start hearing stories, not of, oh, I did this, you know, I, you know God spoke to me and I, blah, blah. actually there's nothing wrong with that, but we begin to start hearing, you know, when we um, were praying for this person, we saw God moving and it really encouraged us. It's little things like that that make all the difference. In the way that we pray, um, Darren prayed it this morning. He, you know, you can use the word we in our prayers rather than I. I pray. What you can do, uh, we need to kind of join in with that in a different way to if I say, we pray. And it's almost easier to say, yeah, we do. So little tiny things like that is a value of actually being in this together. Um, the way we do our notices, the way I preach. You know, I want to do it in such a way that it's, it's inclusive, that we are kind of on this journey together. So the first thing is being in community um, as part of these loving relationships. A second way of doing it is actually that we, uh, as a value, we want to respect the dignity of every single person uh, that we come across, every person certainly in our community here respecting their dignity. And so what that means in practice is when we share our faith, we do that with honesty, with integrity. We don't want to hide things that aren't true. We can actually, you know, part of our sharing of our faith is saying, do you know something? I'm having a hard time. The Christian life isn't necessarily rosy and, you know, fantastic all the time. It can be very, very challenging. We, we are very broken people. And so we can do that with honesty when we share our faith. We can actually say, you know something? I'm, I'm finding it hard. I find it hard when I, um, when I interact with people because of these things that are going on in my life. And actually that very honesty, as we want to portray what we believe, actually is, is authentic in itself. The way we tackle those things um, brings an authenticity that um, is attractive to others. Um, the way that I preach, the, the way that we preach, we want to not talk down to people, even though I'm raised up a little bit higher than you at the moment. <laughs> I don't want to talk down to you in terms emotionally and, and you know, in the way I'm connecting with you. I want to speak up to you, to offer things for you to consider, to think through, to um, receive. That's a, it's a different posture. And it's part of this actually, me loving you. Me is, you know, I have a great privilege of being able to speak here. But actually, I'm, I refuse, I don't want to go to that place and I want to be challenged on that. You know, if, I, if you feel I'm talking down to you, I want to change that. That's, that's not the way we want to relate to each other. In loving relationships, being in community, respecting the dignity of everyone, but also taking responsibility. Actually, if we love people, we need to take responsibility for our part in um, our, our corporate lives together. So that means, um, you know, there's, 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 remember last week I was talking about a lack of commitment. It's almost like a commitment phobia in our society. We don't want to commit to anything. The Facebook, um, yes, no, maybe. Um, uh, there was a, a fourth um, option that someone told me about this week, which is something like um, undecided, you know, something like that. So I can click that, so I don't even need to even say that I might come. So there are, you know, there are so many, we, we, we fear actually committing to say, yes, I'm going to come, or no, I can't come. Yes, I'm going to give. No, I'm not going to give. We, we say, mm, yeah, I'll get around to it. And actually, taking responsibility as part of our loving relationships is something that we want to embody as a church. So that means in our relationships with one another, in our responsibilities um, that we have and being on teams and so on, um, in our stewardship together as a community, in the way that we encourage people. You know, if you see someone who's downcast when they're here or they're, they're looking like they need help, go up to them and encourage them. Sometimes it's easier to just step back and go, oh, I don't know how to do that. And you know, the easiest thing is just to go up and just say, I'm not sure what to say, but are you okay? Much better to be a community that does that um, than not at all, rather than leaving it to other people to do it as well. We want to be in our loving relationships. We want to take responsibility. We want to step out and enjoy um, these, these relationships with one another. Um, I went to the leadership conference that HTB hosted um, last week. And it was an amazing time where um, there were about uh, 6,000 people who were gathered together, um, but also um, another 15,000, something like that, watching online. And one of the speakers there was someone called Patrick Lencioni. He's a management um, communicator. And he talked about um, the five dysfunctions of, of, uh, of a team. 
and uh, it's one of the books that he's written, and I, I recommend that to you. And it's really, he was addressing it as a challenge to groups. And he had five areas that he was um, saying, th these are challenges that all groups need to face and push through in order to uh, basically have better relationships with one another and be able to achieve things. And so his five are, are this. First of all, he said the first challenge is to get over an absence of trust. If there's no trust, you're not going to get anywhere in what you're trying to do. And just as we're playing this out, you might think about your own context in terms of your business or your family or your community and so on. But also think about your connect group and think about church. The first challenge, absence of trust. And the way around that is to take, you know, certainly it's leader-led, but for us to be able to take those steps, those first steps to say, I'm going to be vulnerable. Second dysfunction is a fear of conflict, that we just want to kind of tiptoe around each other if there's a problem. <laughs> Actually, that's not going to get anywhere, because in life, if we rub shoulders with anyone who's different to us, we will come into conflict. And conflict can be healthy. We need to be able to have permission to dissent. It means we need to be able to say, do you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. And we want to encourage that both um, as we gather together here in our midweek groups uh, and so on, one-to-one. -one. But we can do that in a healthy way. Rather than being um, nasty about it, we do it in a loving way. We can lovingly disagree. That makes a huge difference. A third dysfunction is a lack of commitment. We've kind of talked about that. But um, what that looks like in practice is um, no one stepping forward and saying, I'll do it. I'll help. It's going to be costly, it's going to involve 1% of my time, but I'm prepared to commit myself to help on that um, event. Actually, most of the things that we do as a community are pretty easy. But it's actually as we grow in trust, as we grow in commitment, that will become more and more costly to us. That 1% will go up to 5%, 10%, 20%. Sometimes people need us. And the sign of a a loving community is when people step out and say, I'll sacrifice my time to help you. When people make that kind of sacrifice, that makes a huge impact on that group. A fourth challenge um, is the avoidance of accountability. When people actually aren't accountable to each other at all. You know, I say one thing and I do another. And I don't let you challenge me at all. Accountability actually is a really healthy, helpful thing. It, it stops me from going into seriously um, bad decision-making, particularly moral decision-making. So if I am not accountable as a leader, if, I'm not, if I don't make myself accountable to my peers particularly, but those people around me, then I can get detached sometimes from reality and get led down a path of sin and stuff that I will completely regret can have a devastating effect on other people. The avoidance of accountability is addressed by being accountable, getting into a connect group, and we have small groups within connect groups that help us to grow in trust and commitment and, um, and accountability. And his fifth dysfunction is an inattention to results, where actually we don't even think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. But um, actually his... Um, argument is to say, well, for example, in a connect group, let's think about the results. Do, do people actually want to come? <laughs> is it fun to come along? Do people feel better having come to our group than they did when they came, uh, when they arrived? So um, there's something about thinking through how we're doing things and why we're doing it so that it's good. So that actually this value of enjoying it with others, people want to come back. That's a helpful and healthy thing, I think. And Jesus, um, I think, shows the way in these five dysfunctions as well, in terms of showing the way it can be done. But the key, I think, to Lencioni's um, way of uh, approaching it is this, having loving relationships. That's the way through that I'm enjoying these groups. So building trust through being vulnerable, having healthy disagreement, taking responsibility in our groups, um, having these peer-to-peer -peer accountability in small groups, and playing your part to make your connect group or your church a great connect group and a great church. So my action from this loving relationships part of the Enjoy It With Others is join a connect group. If you're in one, make it better. Recruit people into your connect group. 
If, you're in a, if you can't be in a connect group, one of the existing ones, we'd love to hear about it so that we can try and work out how we can form a connect group around you. There are some people who can't make Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Um, those are the main ones that, that meet. There are, but there are other ways we can do it. We believe in connect groups so much that we want to help you to be a part of this if you possibly can. So that's the first thing, loving relationships. The second area um, that comes under this, I'm enjoying it with others, is being part of dynamic teams. And um, there are lots of different ways of drawing this. I'm gonna draw this like, um, you know how they, you know, football things like that. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get into trouble now. Um, okay, yeah, that's the goal. So then we've got, here's the team chart. So this is gonna be a four, two, four layout. <laughs> I don't know anything about football. <laughs> I'm sure that would do for this game. We want dynamic teams. We want to be part of a team. You know, the, one of the challenges in a team is that you have, it's full of individuals who just play an individual game. But everyone knows that if you've got a team of individuals who don't play as a team, that is worse, you know, a team of dynamic individuals, that is worse than a team of people who are okay who are playing as a dynamic team. People who are okay playing as a dynamic team will always play better than a bunch of individuals. Dynamic teams is what we want to go for. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you is a part of this team, the body of Christ team. Every one of us plays a part. This is about serving with others. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about geese. Geese. We have a lot of them here on the basin. The, the primary um, interaction we have with geese on the Shadow Basin is that they poo a lot. Okay, that's the main one. But if you see them flying, they have some very interesting dynamics. They fly in a V formation, geese. And um, they're able to cover huge distances by taking this particular formation and going from one area um, in, their, um, uh, in their movements from, you know, from uh, across continents. Um, and uh, how do they do it? Well, a number of ways. The first one is that in this V, so there's a, you know, a lead goose and there's all these geese in, in, in the V and then they have a couple of um, other Vs behind it. The lead goose swaps around. So they swap around their leadership, they rotate it. So when one goose gets tired, he kind of, he or she, I don't know, um, moves along, and someone else, uh, not once, another goose, <laughs> comes up to the front and takes the lead. They, um, you know, they take it in turns to take point. Second thing is by flying as they do in this, um, in this V shape, um, the members of the flock create an upward cu air current because of the way that they, they're just one behind the other. So as they flap, the, the, the air current that's produced actually helps the goose next door to it to um, have less energy involved in flying itself. So as each one flies, as long as they're in line and formation, the, each one benefits from the one in front. And they have, um, they have something like a 30% greater efficiency in flying because of this V formation. Um, when a goose gets sick or wounded, what happens is it leaves the formation and goes down and um, takes a, a little rest on the, on the ground. But what happens is that two geese go with it and look after it. And they stay until that goose is better. And they kind of come and catch up later on. And there's a role for those who are not just in this formation at the front. One of the things you will hear when you are near a, a flock of geese flying is that they're honking. There's a lot of honking that's going on. And actually, who is doing the honking? It's not the ones at the front. It's the ones at the back. They are honking. They're saying, keep going. Come on. Wah, wah, wah. You know, <laughs> or however they do it. <laughs> they're honking encouragement to the lead geese. Say, keep going. We're with you. We want to, we're part of this, we, we depend on you to keep going, and I'll play my part in being point, you know, at some stage, but 
while I'm just at the back, I'm going to keep on encouraging. Every single goose has a part to play. There's one thing that stands out in all of that, is that these geese work together. They're a team. They work together and they're able to achieve far more than they could on their own. So in our teams, we've got teams in a number of areas in the church and we're going to encourage people to join teams today. Our teams, we want everyone to be involved in a team. I mean, it is fun. We'll come on to that in a minute. It's fun being part of a team, but actually being in a team is a dynamic place to be involved. We, we recognize that everyone has a gift to, to contribute. If you look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul says, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Not to some, no, it's to each one. Every single person has a gift given by God for the common good so that everyone can benefit from it. So everyone involved, everyone gifted, and everyone fulfilled because they're using, if they're using the gift they've been given, they're playing their part, they're seeing the results of what they're doing, it's fulfilling. You just think, wow, this is fantastic. This is the church at work. And we also want these teams here to be um, kind of characterized by laughter and fun and passion. People going for it, having fun together. And I see that in the teams here. People have fun. There's a, there's a sense of togetherness. And um, sometimes there are moments of hard work, sometimes not. But actually, people are enjoying this together. So here are some teams we've just put up on the screen. Um, uh, I've put four C's because they're easier to remember. Um, we've got the creative team. That's about music and sound. Kind of music here, sound, desk, projection, um, um, the, the kind of wider media, there's the camera work there, but also kind of producing things like SPS News and videos. We'd have, love to have more videos on, um, around that we could use. Um, decorating is part of a creative kind of gift in there. Um, lots of opportunities for that. Connecting is another one. This is about the welcome ministry, the hospitality that um, we're able to give to people, a refreshments, baking, but also helping people into connect groups. That's something every one of us can play a part in. Um, children, we've, um, this is a children's church, an amazing children's church going on at the moment, led by Jess um, McLeod. And um, we're always looking for, for recruits in that so that we can help people to, uh, uh, to help the children. Um, there are children's clubs, like the one in half term coming up on the 30th and 31st of May. Um, youth, there's a youth, new youth group that's being led by Philippa and Simon, and um, it's fantastic, but you might like to help with that. And fun days um, that we do in the community. Then there's community, the fourth C. This, we've got a number of different ways that we um, get involved with this, but money advice, the um, ministry that Jackie Driver um, heads up in terms of helping people who um, want to get their finances sorted or want help with that, but also those who are in serious debt to be able to kind of manage that. Um, uh, football um, is being... Where's Gareth? Gareth leads a brilliant football ministry. Um, uh, with, uh, in, in our community here. Talk to Gareth if you want to come hang out with him and have some fun with that because it's a great thing. Um, in fact, you've got a little, yeah, there's this one here. Father's Football, Hope Football Club, little sign at the back. Go and have a look at that if you're interested in playing football. Um, XLP Mentoring, this is about mentoring young adults who, no, well, kind of late teens who um, are really struggling at school. They need some help. They need someone to just come alongside them for an hour a week and just hang out with them, just share values with them to help them in order to um, make some right choices in their lives later on. Um, Matt's House heads that up. And the Night Shelter, a huge ministry here, is probably one of the biggest things, 70, 75 people involved in Night Shelter. It was happening last night, uh, no, Saturday, uh, Friday night here in the church. So lots of different teams. Why don't you join a team um, today? And um, another way that we are involved in um, dynamic teams is with, uh, and playing our part, is with our church finances. I mentioned this at the beginning, and um, if you're a visitor here today, uh, forgive me for just saying this, I just want to, well, it's good for you to hear this, but um, our finances at the moment are challenged. The reason for that is that um, 
we've done a church planting where a lot of our givers have um, gone to church plants and there's a natural throughput of about 30% of people just moving to London for a while and then moving on to other cities or nations. And so the giving, number of people giving in the church is about a third of the church. And we would love everyone to give to the church on a regular basis. But the third, we're particularly looking to increase the third people giving to two thirds of people giving by the end of August. We'd love it to be 100%. Um, it's almost impossible because there are new people coming here every week. But we'd love it to be as much as possible. But we'd love you to play your part. If you consider yourself a member of the church, please give. Because at the moment, we will run out of money um, over the summer. And um, whilst there's regular giving, um, we need to have another something like £7,000 um, pounds regularly each month in order to um, meet our expenditure um, needs. So it's not a huge amount, but actually it makes a, a big difference if lots and lots of people are involved. Last week, five people started standing orders, um, direct debits um, with stewardship. And we'd love, we're actually aiming for another 95. We've got 100 already. We'd love another 100 um, direct debits um, from, the, from the church. We've got about 350 people in the church. And what that means in practice is, you know, we'd love you to think about, if you're not doing this already, why don't you give something regularly to the church? If you've never done it before, we encourage people to look at their income and say, what, you know, under God, what, what would you like me to give to the church? And then take a, a I'd encourage you to proportion a percentage of your income and then set up a direct debit with stewardship and you can choose where it goes. We'd love to encourage you to give here because we need the money. Um, some people think, oh, it's running so well, you've got everything. Actually, we are running well. We're, we're very efficient with our finances, but um, we need to encourage people to give, otherwise we'll have to stop things um, from the summer onwards. So please do um, give to those finances. And our goal, again, is for, to get one-third of people giving by direct debits, so at the moment it's 100, to two-thirds, that's 200. So if you would like to do that today, we'd love to encourage you to do that, and there are some forms that will be available at the back of church. It's very, very simple to fill out, and um, it takes about one minute to be able to either start a direct debit, or you, if you give already, you might like to give a one-off gift, which also takes about a minute to do that as well. So um, two responses here to dynamic teams. One is join a team, have a chance to do that at the end of the service, and the second thing is please do give. Um, if you can. Third area of in, um, under enjoy it with others is far reaching unity. And one of Jesus' prayers was uh, at the Last Supper in John 17 was that we, the church, might be one. And I think he's talking about it in a number of different ways. He's talking about it as, a, as inside a church fellowship, but also he's talking about all the churches around the world. He's talking about a far-reaching unity. And the body of Christ, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. The body is not just local, it's global. And so the way we treat each other and the way we relate to other churches is important for us as a church. It is about joining in with others, this far-reaching unity. And I'm going to draw this as three interlocking circles. Um, it's kind of Trinitarian. And just shows that actually there's a diversity there, but there's also unity. We do things together. Um, when I was... Uh, traveling when I was a lot younger. I um, went through Malaysia and I went to a place called Malacca. Has anyone been to Malacca before? Yeah. So I don't know if this was 25 years ago, but Malacca 25 years ago was pink. It's a pink town in Malaysia. The reason it's pink is because the British Army, when they left Malaysia um, after the Second World War, they left um, a warehouse full of pink paint because it's useful in the army to have pink paint. Um, <laughs> So they left it there because it was so useful. And so the town began to use it to paint their houses. And so when you go in, you are just overwhelmed by the sense that actually everything's pink. And um, it, it was a rather extraordinary experience. So I went there when I was traveling. And I actually um, I arrived on a Friday night, uh, no, Saturday night. And I was going to Singapore, which is close by, on the Sunday. And basically, I'd run out of money. So I prayed. Um, 
Jesus, please, would you help me to um, find someone who would give me some food? And um, uh, I could have gone starving, that's fine. Not starving, I'd just been you know, 24 hours without food when, when, once I got to Singapore. But I prayed, and the next, I was wandering around on the Saturday night, and I saw Anglican Church. I thought, oh, you know, I'll go to the Anglican Church in Malacca. So I turned up the next morning, and I sat next to this Indian family in Malacca. And um, there are lots of Indians in Malaysia, and they turned to me, and they said, oh, hello, you know, you're not from around here. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> um, and they said, um, would you like to come and have breakfast with us afterwards? So I thought, yes, Lord, thank you very much. Indeed. But, you know, the breakfast was yeah, a simple answer to prayer. But what was more profound for me was going home with these, um, this Indian family. We played Monopoly, of all things, um, in Malaysia, in Malacca. Um, and I just thought, this is an extraordinary thing. The unity that you've given us across continents, across churchmanships, across um, uh, races, and um, in so many different ways, you've given us a unity of spirit because we are in the same family. Jesus is our brother and God is our father. Jesus prayed that we might be one as a sign for the world to believe. So we want to encourage unity inside our church. That's a unity of spirit and mind. We're behind the vision. We love each other. People see this community and think, wow, they are, you know, they're so different, but they're together. There's something about them that is attractive. Live that out. We want that unity of spirit and heart and mind. But also we need to live out a unity across churches, different churches. There's a, a Catholic church, St. Patrick's over there. We've got other Anglican churches here. We've got E1 Community Church, a house church just here. Um, so many different kinds of churches just in our immediate locale. So, you know, it's a chance for us to work together with them, to prefer them, to pray for them, to speak well of them. Again, one of the things that we've experienced through Alpha is that Alpha is working in every denomination in the world. It's working in over, it's something like 169 countries in the world. It's working in almost every church denomination. We, we love that. And the reason it works in so many different contexts is because it's focused on Jesus. And Jesus is the one who, who, um, who unites us. And so we take the, the values on Alpha, the similar values to what we have as well. We want to go for that unity. Um, Bill Hybels at this conference last week said this, we cannot live for our cause to win. We have to live for his cause to win. So we here at St. Paul's are not going to spend time arguing with other churches. We believe different things. 5% of the time. 95% of the time we agree with that we're heading in the same direction. So as a church, we are going to pray for other churches. We're going to honor the leaders of other churches, even if we disagree with them. We will honor them. We will always speak well of them. You will, I hope you will never, ever hear from this stage any um, words against other leaders. We don't want to do that. We don't want to live like that. And we want to partner with other churches in Tower Hamlets, East London, London and the UK and beyond. And we want to seek God's kingdom together. Again, at this conference, there was a Roman Catholic cardinal called um, Christoph Schonberg. And um, he's the cardinal of Austria, of Vienna. And um, I encourage you to go online to watch his interview. It's the most amazing interview. Nikki Gumbel, who is the leader of, uh, of HTB, does this very gracious interview with him. And um, the cardinal comes across in this interview as just a lovely, warm, gracious man. Um, he talks about his own experience of um, a personal relationship with Jesus. He talks about the work of the Spirit in his life, um, uh, talking particularly about how they chose the Pope, you know, the conclave where they all got together behind closed doors. And he just said the Spirit of God was at work. It was clear. He's not allowed to talk about it. They're, they're threatened with excommunication if they say what goes on inside and outside. So, um, but he was very clear about that, but he said God's spirit was at work um, in that conclave, and um, he knows the new Pope personally, and um, just said some wonderful things about him. And um, we saw 
a new kind of ecumenism, I think there. Ecumenism is churches working together, looking and loving towards each other, saying we can do this together. We can, we're different, but we're on the same page in terms of what we're trying to do. So what do we want to do in our value? We want to bless and pray for other churches. We want to be a blessing to other churches, not just our own. That's what we want to be. We want to have far-reaching unity in what we do as a church. And the fourth and final thing is having fun. It's the enjoy it with other. It's enjoy it bit of enjoy it with others. And I think overall, how am I going to do this? Um, okay, so this is me. Self-portrait. And um, I've got a balloon. And um, let's have some different balloons here. Because I want to have a value that says, we want to have a value that says we want to have fun in this. We want to enjoy it with others. Um, the church has had a reputation of being boring. It's not supposed to be boring. It's not supposed to be like that. You know, in heaven, there are so many pictures in the scriptures of heaven being a place full of joy. There are going to be no more tears, no more sadness, no more crying, no more pain. And the pictures of the wedding feast, it's a feast. A wedding feast is a celebration where it's fun. Um, the, the celebration when the prodigal son returns to the father who, who picks up his, his clothes and runs towards the, um, his son who's coming back. Angels rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. This is a picture of joy, of fun, of laughter, um, smiling. Karina, uh, some of you will remember Karina who's gone back to Sweden. She came into this church and became a Christian because someone smiled at her. That smile comes from this value. Now, it doesn't mean that, there, that, that um, we need to have a superficiality about our lives. We don't want to pretend that nothing bad's happening. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about actually, what is the general state that we want to operate in? Do we want to make a value out of being boring? Or do we want to make a value out of preferring something slightly more optimistic and fun? And actually in that, we want that to be a real fun. So actually when someone's crying, we come alongside and we say, let's allow the Spirit of God to come and touch you and help you. Let's love each other in that place. But you know, the extraordinary thing in ministry, the ministry of the Spirit, is that sometimes people will laugh and sometimes people will cry and the crying is because God, the God who loves them is healing them so that they can come to a place of laughter. Having fun is so important. I'd love to show you just a little video just to lighten things up a bit. And um, this is a song which you'll recognize, Let It Be Known. Um, and this is an uncut video that actually you can see on YouTube because if you want to show it, we love showing our children and we always have a laugh about it. I spoke to Andrew and he said, um, I said, do you know which video clip it is? And he said, oh yeah, I'm always showing it to Olivia. And um, it's just fun. It just, um, it's slightly um, raucous, and, uh, but it's it just says, I think it embodies this value a little bit. So sit back and enjoy this value on this um, song. But having fun is a choice that we don't want to be superficial. We want to be something that actually enables us to enjoy um, being part of this family. And um, uh, that is um, something that actually we really can do a, you know, a lot about. And I love embodying that here. I want to finish with a story about um, going back a few centuries to um, Cyprian. He was converted in midlife in North Africa in the third century. And he was well aware of the vice and decay of the Roman Empire um, that he was living in. And he um, chose to follow Jesus. And he later became the Bishop of Carthage and he got into trouble with the authorities where the emperor said, um, you know, you must worship me, the emperor, and he refused, and so he was um, executed um, as a result of that choice. But in his first writing, he, um, in his first Christian writing, he wrote to someone called Donatus, 
and um, who is a friend of his, and he uh, said this. It's a bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and good people who have learned this, the great secret of life. They have found a joy and wisdom which is a thousand times better than any of the pleasures of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are the masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are Christians, and I am one of them. <laughs>